Hi everyone, I hope you're all well and thank you for joining our presentation today. Uh, Mike and I are going to be talking about the work of Project Limu and how dance has an impact on young people from the work that we do. So we'll start off and introduce ourselves first. So I'm Georgia and I'm a final year primary education student studying at um, Edge Hill University. So I first came in um, to knowledge of Mike's work through seeing an article on his work um, of teaching ballet in Kibera on social media. And at the time we were planning a trip to Kenya. So when I realized how close the project was to where we we're going to be, I contacted Mike. Um, and that at the time they were asking for ballet shoes and dance clothes. So as a dancer, Dance myself, I started to collect dance clothes so that when we went over, we could give them to the children. And, and from there, Mike explained that he was in the new year starting to develop Project Alimu and asked if I wanted to be a part of it. So, of course, I said yes. So that's been, I think, three years we've been working together and I've been volunteering with the project. So that's how we've come together to work. Mike, do you want to? Yes, that, yeah, it has been really a huge pleasure also working together with you. And of course, there have been a lot that we've been able to achieve within Project Elimu. And uh, briefly, I'm just, uh, I'm Michael Maya. I'm a dance teacher, as Georgia did say. And uh, of course, I studied dance a bit, uh, both uh, in the Netherlands, in the UK, and also in Kenya. But I found the need of becoming a dance teacher as I did um, study dance uh, everything was given to me for free and I thought, okay, I need to be able to use dance also to influence my own community in one way or the other. So it's with that that I thought of setting up Project Elimu. Besides Project Elimu, I was also working for different schools, uh, different both local and international schools in terms of teaching dance. And uh, luckily four years ago or four and a half years ago, I was uh, named amongst the top 10 finalists for the Global Teacher Prize which was also a very huge boost towards the work we are doing and also uh, towards the uh, perception transformation of my own community because uh, initially before Kibra was known for very wrong reasons, I'm very glad with this uh, our nomination, uh, it, it put a spotlight on me as a teacher here and that also put a lot of spotlight on my students and uh, my work in general within Kibra and we were able to change the mindset and the perception of people towards Kibra. Uh, so Kibra is an informal settlement uh, in, in Kenya, is now one of the biggest uh, slum. And um, according to the last uh, population census, they did uh, approximately uh, place at, at over 200,000 people. But um, in me, I think yeah, we are way more than 200,000 people. Uh, the problem have always been like infrastructure and how to get uh, tangible data in regards to the population. So within Kibra, there are lots and lots of challenges affecting this community. And uh, one of the key one is uh, gender-based violence, which is a very broad uh, challenge affecting both children and women. And also now it's growing into affecting men. And um, access to safe spaces for young girls and boys to be able to just play and uh, 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 be, have fun and just be themselves. As uh, with the rise of population, we're seeing more and more people coming into the city. And with this, all these open spaces that we used to have are now being taken over by housing. And uh, those housing, so meaning children are now not having like spaces that they can actually be themselves. We are also having a very broad challenge around um, menstruation and menstruation products in Kenya. As uh, still uh, in 2021, there's still cases of young girls missing schools due to access to menstrual products. And it's within this that we're also trying within a, a, a project Elimu to how do we address these challenges. And one, one key one is also a platform for young people to just learn basic skills that enables them earn a de decent livelihood. As um, most of our education system, the, our schools are crowded. And uh, we have very few schools. I'll take you through our small um, uh, educational ecosystem. We have um, nine public schools that are still being built, uh, more are still being built. At this particular time, we have like nine public primary schools. We have public eight public high schools. But 
With the rise of population, the community found the need of developing uh, low cost uh, schools and local schools that are built by NGOs, are built by uh, businessmen and women, but also some are supported by churches. And we have over 100 private primary schools and over 60 private community based schools. So these schools are looked at as private schools, yet they lack the capacities that other private schools that are out of Kibra are, are, are having access to. So it is with this reason that we did set up Project Elimu. And Project Elimu, the aim of it was to have um, a social enterprise that would uh, bridge the gap between play and education. As uh, within Kibra, the high uh, children are competing for very limited slots that are available for them because the government is offering scholarships, the churches are doing the same, but no one is investing on scholarships, mainly for children who failed in school. So we are having lots and lots of children competing for the limited resources that are available within the community to be able to just get access to high school. With this, we did thought, okay, we set up an after school program when our children can also just be themselves. Because growing up myself, I also uh, was not an easy child and I was not easy because of the challenges that were affecting me at home. So in there, we did set up an after school arts education program where we had run ballet classes, we do drama, music, and painting. We also have a program that now uh, we call the Smile Bank, which is around sexually productive health and rights. And we have a digital literacy program. And we also designed a support, uh, a community support uh, program that supports both the community and parents within our program. We are a very small space in Kibra where we built our own dance school and all this is done by our own community and our parents. And that in there is where we host our ballet program. And this program attracts so many children within the community as one particular class in Georgia, you, uh, you'd say to this because we would have like around 120 children who are all coming in to dance at one particular time. And yeah, we run the program on an open door policy because it is not about being a professional dancer, but it's about using arts and getting knowledge from the arts that will enable you change the living condition within our own community. So we bring, we mold all the children together. So in there we have children, regardless of their disability, their age and their group and their friendship and their tribes, we all have them on the same place and they all just have to dance together and just have fun. Within the space, we also have an open library and uh, uh, part of this Georgia will touch on uh, going further, but uh, we also have a computer lab and uh, here the library is more based on uh, books that are also we're trying to find books that are also written with black people and also books that are also showing animation of young people who are black so that the children can also see themselves through the animated uh, images in those books. So our arts program. Our arts program is quite very extraordinary because children come in regardless of who they are, how their background is, how their parents are. And we've seen it like they come in with different problems, but for a particular small time, they get to just fully enjoy themselves and really express themselves. And from there, we've been able to design different programs within this space. We normally, um, now with the arts program, we designed painting and uh, for children who don't want to do dance, they can now do acrobatics and gymnastics. Some can now get into painting, music, and drama. Every year we are hosting a, a festival and uh, it's so unfortunate with the COVID-19, we've not been able to do our festival last year and this year also the same. But uh, our first festival, Voices of Kibra in 2018, I think, and with that brought around 120 plus children who are there dancing together and uh, in very colorful costumes and costumes that were locally designed by our local people. And uh, we also did a billion dreams and a billion dreams was more on putting a spotlight on our community and some of the impact and achievements we've, we've been able to gain as a community. So how we work, uh, our program is uh, designed mainly on using arts as a tool to engage and motivate learners within our community. As you see, we, our program is making learning fun, is making children eager to go back to school, is making children to look forward to going to school because they're getting access to dancing, they're now getting access to playing, they're also getting access to doing 
other activities that are not academically oriented. And with that, we've seen a very tremendous growth in young children because we've seen improvement on self-esteem of these young kids. And we've also seen it piling on to the parents because now the child is much more focused in school and also she takes the same back at home. So the child is ready to do other things and you find like the parents are now commending our arts program by they're saying uh, the child is much more organized. The child is taking much more responsibilities at home in terms of doing the houseworks. They are able to now do them quickly, organize themselves and be able to make their time to come back for our dance classes. But with this, we, we start off with the dance and slowly we introduce different disciplines into that child. Within their normal schooling system, every child gets around 40 minutes for any subject learning. But here they get, for instance, reading. We use it not reading specifically focused for exams, but focused for leisure. So children just open up books and they read regardless of uh, knowing very well, they're not gonna be tested with this. And this we've seen their uh, reading abilities growing. We've seen children now picking up books every now and then, and they want to look into it. But also through our festivals, we've been able to design like dialogue sessions where now the community come together and issues around gender-based violence is now being talked to and being normalized. And like before, when um, sexual reproductive health was coming out, you find that the male people are not able to openly speak up and talk about it. But when we do our dance and the children are confronting the community with these very critical issues, we find them warming up, we find them easing up and we find them creating that platform for dialogue. And, and with that, we've received a lot of support within our community because our dance space was actually built by our parents. And uh, we fundraised money from within our community because they've seen a sense of transformation uh, from our program. And I'll let Georgia take over this, uh, the reading club that have been one of the most successful programs that we've done. Okay, so our Reading for Pleasure scheme, it started from, during my first trip, I volunteered in one of the schools in Kibera and the head teacher explained that they had an extreme lack of books for the children. And the couple of books that they did have were all about Western culture, so the children couldn't relate to them, the stories in any way. So we thought that was something that we needed to aim for to try and collect. So um, I started to collect books where, as Mike said, there were black children and it reflected the African culture. It was quite hard because there is an extreme lack of it. Um, but we uh, contacted lots of bookstores and lots of authors who very kindly donated books and then also from people of the public. So we brought those over and we put them into the picture that Mike showed you early into the big bookcase. And it was lovely, wasn't it, Mike? Because they all just instantly picked up the books. We weren't sure how they were going to react to it. but um, And I think one of my favourite memories was reading with a little boy. I think he was about three and he just kind of looked at it and was like, it looks like me. So it was it's really nice them to be able to engage with books. Um, and also, as Mike was saying, because it, it's all in one space for the children to come, they can come in and read the books whenever they want. If they don't have them at home or in school, they know that at the centre, they're there for them. And if they have anything, they they just want to come read, they want to come and dance, it's there for them and it's open. Um, there was one time when there were so many people that came to dance that we didn't have enough space for them. So we split them in half didn't we Mike we had half in the garden reading books and then half in dance and then we swapped and we just kept doing it but it worked really well because kids were always entertained and they were doing stuff that was going to help them and so in this picture on the I think it's the right I'm not sure if it's flipped and um, this was a FaceTime with Alison who's the author of Little Birds so she donated lots of books for the children and it's about how um if you're told that you can't do something, if you if that's your dream, then you can do it. So it was a very inspiring story. And Alison kindly interviewed, um, let the children interview her and they discussed about their dreams. And you can see um, one of the pa papers that one of the little boys is holding up, they were writing about their dreams. And I think, Mike, when we were talking the other day, I, we were talking about um, the new, on the other side, the Lego program and um, a computer and engineering uh, program and one of the children was writing how that he wanted to invent a flying car and that how he had this plan to kind of engineer and Mike did you say that he's now got into a engineering program in yes. Nairobi yes and which was lovely to hear so yeah 
Sorry, you go. Yeah, he's now he's now doing uh he, he's now part of a STEM group based in here in Nairobi, and they are doing innovations, and uh, it's so amazing some of these innovations that these children have been able to come up with, and it all starts just from a dancing floor. So they all dance together, they all embrace each other, and now how the teamwork. Uh, is, 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 is going on amongst them because they are able now to design solutions within uh, their own community. And yes, he's now like really uh, a proud boy <laughs> doing engineering, <laughs> still in primary school. And that's just the start of a very bright future of him. Yeah. Yeah. And also with them, with them being able to do so many activities together in one space, you can see the friendships that they're creative. Because remember at first, not a lot of them wouldn't talk to each other, would they? But now they're all, because they're doing these experiences together, it's developed their social skills as well. And um, But going back to the reading project, something that stood out to us that Alison said was that the only difference between me and you with regards to writing is that I'm a published author. There's no, you are also authors. So our next project, hopefully when COVID calms down a bit, is for the children over the course of the year to write their own story so that we're developing um, books from Kibera that are stem from these children's experiences and they're written by um, black children about their lives. So we're creating that, um, I can't, the legacy, I guess. So mm -hmm. they get to see themselves yeah. doing writing and authors and things like that. Yes, and the, and the beauty of it is how they also now, the level of confidence that creates in them. Also not being yep. very negative within the education system, but the education, the challenge most of our institutions are facing is people are being prepared for exams, but they're not being prepared for lifelong learning, and they're not being prepared to be able to trigger or change or design change within their own community. And I'm very glad like using arts activities that we do, which we do not focus on exams. It is now, it becomes yeah. a continuation activity. And with this now we're seeing, yeah, there will be a bigger project coming up of the books and I'm very much looking forward for that. Yeah. So. This is just but one of our activities that we do. And next, we also have a very successful program. We call it the Smile Bank. So the Smile Bank is a sexual reproductive health and rights program that supports over 1,300 young girls with two packets of sanitary towels and also information every single month. And uh, with this, we've seen a very broad change because this program was actually designed by the girls who are part of our dancing program. I could not understand seeing oh, young girls in Kibra uh, not able to dance because they are holding themselves back because they are having their periods. And it is with this, then I ask the children, how do we design a long lasting solution around it? And we're very grateful because the program was, uh, is being supported now by Kuchik Foundation through um, uh, Dominica Kuchik. And uh, through her support, the girls have been able to now take the confidence that they've built from our own dancing space into the wider community. And they've been very tremendous, very helpful because they've also been able to innovate some uh, companies within uh, our school. So not only that they are just dancing, they're becoming like entrepreneurs, they're now looking beyond. And of course, everything is through playing. So we fail here and there, but we still have solution to the problems that are facing us. Within a normal school setting, it's very hard to teach children how to innovate, how to design something. But within us, because we work within a community setting, it's very easy to look into the community problems, bring them into our dancing space and say, okay, let's come up with something around this. And I want to share a very short video. And um, during COVID, uh, some of our girls, uh, Faith and her friends, they innovated, uh, they started a soap making business. And through that business, some of them were even able to see themselves back in school in 2021. So I will play this short video and I hope you guys will enjoy it. Our business name is Brilliant Enterprise. We do make liquid detergent in Project Elimu. We have Smile Bank, which is a program that deals with the light skill and distribution of sanitary towels. So in there, we were taught how to 
be a good entrepreneur and to come up with a business idea. Me and my friend here came up with a business idea of making a soap. This was after how we had been taught some life skills and entrepreneurship. We told our teachers there and they decided to give us the capital to start the business. The kind of transformation that Smile Bank has brought into my life is it has enabled me to be busy and to be a responsible girl with good behaviors. Because initially I was that guy who was shy and I was not able to speak even in front of one person. But through the mentorship and the motivation that I've gained in Smile Bank, I'm now confident and I'm able to speak even in front of more than 30 people. We are living in a society where girls are taken to be those people who are best in washing utensils, mopping the house, and they can't do this other jobs like being a doctor, being an engineer, being a pilot. But Smile Bank has been motivating us and has taught us that each gender is equal and we, we girls can also do it and be a better person in the future. The number of teenage pregnancy has risen. I had a lot of friends who were using drugs and they were encouraging me to join them. If it wasn't for Project Elimu, maybe I could have been one of the victims. And even through the motivational talks, I've also been able to raise my confidence not as it was earlier. As to me, Project Elimu is like a second home and a better place to be. Our business Yes. Yeah, so that's just but one of our small uh, activity that we do within Smile Bank that started off just from uh, young girls wanting to dance to now young girls designing solution to problems that are affecting the world. Yes, it might just be uh, COVID-19 is a global problem, not just only in Kibra. So plucking that child, placing her in New York, I am 100% sure that she will be able to design solution around that specific place. So. This also within COVID-19, we also had a lot of challenges. We had like 90 plus percent of our parents lost their sources of income. And that it was not easy for our community to survive. The same, same girls came back together again and asked, what if we can design a food drive? So we've been doing performances online. We've been doing exchange programs online. We've been doing uh, talks online. And with that, we've raised money and since April last year, we've been supporting our community and our parents in terms of uh, food support. And we can't be where we are now if it wasn't for that open dance space that we had envisioned and we had created. So to me, dance is, a, is the biggest source of transformation because when it lays the foundation to enable us understand our students' needs, it also gives them the connection and giving them opportunity to critical thinking and they become like solution designers and developers within our own community. And I, I've always believed so hard that poverty uh, is just a state of mind. It has a very strong way of disrupting a child's mind, but with good education, uh, it can trigger resiliency and determination in that same, same human being in terms of designing and crafting change within our own society. And as I always believe, yeah, we all have solutions to the problems that are affecting us. What we just need to do is to give it a thought and to listen and to focus, and then we'll find the solution. And so I'm really grateful for you guys joining us. And I'm really grateful for you, Georgia, for the amount of work we've been able to do together. And uh, I'm so looking forward in picking this going forward, Georgia. Brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So thank you guys so much. Bye bye bye. Bye.